Hey Park, it's Pastor Rafe and uh, wanted to check in with you for a bit of a midweek uh, moment of encouragement and also just kind of pointer towards the word. Uh, but I want to start today with just a little bit of an announcement. And uh, you all, if you're on my email list, then you have seen uh, this update. But this is really, really important. Uh, we are launching, for the first time, uh, we're going to be launching a men's and women's ministry for the summer. Now, I just want to make sure you get a little background here. Uh, the majority of our small groups at Park South Loop are mixed. What that means is that we do men and women and single and married and young and old all together in our small groups. Our small groups meet throughout the week to study the Bible and to pray with each other and to encourage one another in their faith. And one of the reasons we're very intentional that most of our small groups look at that way, rather than isolating into like a men's small group and a women's small group, most are mixed. And the reason is, is because that's really a picture of the church. I think that we are really encouraged by each other, and I grow a lot from learning from my single friends. I, I grow a lot as a, as a man from learning from women who are in our small group, and, and vice versa. The image of the church is that we all need each other, and so we've had a priority on that for quite a while. This summer, uh, typically over the summer, our small groups take a break. There's a bit of a natural break that occurs with summer as a lot of people are traveling or just schedules are different and people are outside more and it's a little bit more difficult to kind of pin down into uh, specific small group times. But this summer, we are going to have a very intentional launch of a 10-week men's and women's small groups that are very particularly focused on men's and women's ministry. Now, I want to explain what I mean by that. Uh, for 10 weeks, starting in June, on the, the week of June 7th, which is a Sunday, we're going to launch these groups. Now, I'm hoping, we got to wait and see what the law says and, and all that and work through this with wisdom. I'm hoping groups of up to 10 will be able to meet in person. If not, we'll do Zoom calls and all of that. And even when we can meet in person, there probably will have to be a Zoom component to these. In person is going to be best and the most ideal, though, if we can do that. Uh, but right now, we're gonna, we're, we want everyone to sign up for either the men's or the women's. Men, I just want you to understand, I am actually writing 10 weeks of curriculum for our men, getting into everything about what it means to be a biblical man, about what masculinity actually is, what does the Word of God call us to as men, what are our responsibilities as men, and what are the ways that culture is just totally telling us lies that oftentimes we've believed or we've experienced wounds in our life that hinder us from living out the, the mandate for men. And I really am excited for this material. I've been working hard on it with a great team of guys. And I want to challenge every man to sign up for that men's ministry. Women, you have an incredible opportunity before you as well. You already have a lot of women who are signed up for this women's ministry. We have a great team that's working through curriculum. And there is going to be the same thing, meeting in groups, going through the curriculum, studying and really digging into being women of God. Uh, if I could just say this, uh, as of right now, and I've sent this out twice in emails, we have uh, just about 30 women who are signed up and six men. Now, I tell you that, church, because that is the reason why I'm investing a lot of time in writing the men's ministry curriculum. Uh, historically, and what we're seeing right now, women are do a much better job of jumping in and digging in and, and being a part of what the church is doing. Men tend to go after the sin of Adam, which was passivity. And I think we're actually seeing that right now. I know there's a lot of factors at play. I'm not calling anybody out. Uh, but here's what I'd like to see. I would like to see every man at Park South Loop sign up for the men's ministry this summer. And I would like to see every women, woman at Park South Loop sign up for the women's ministry. This is not a summer off. This is a summer digging in to developing leadership for the church. And I want everyone to be a part of it. It's going to be powerful. I will be sending out way more details to everyone who signs up. Know this for right now. Just get signed up and commit to it. It's going to be worth your while and it's going to be so foundational for the future of the church, okay? Now with that, I want to dig us into a really great psalm today. Psalm 2, a very powerful psalm. I shared last week Psalm 1. And if you remember, I said Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 serve as kind of the, the doorways whereby we enter into the entire book of Psalms. Within Psalm 1 and 2, you have all the themes that then get played out in all the rest of the Psalms. 
And in Psalm 1, we saw the main theme of righteousness and wickedness, these two different ways to live your life. You can choose to live by God's standard of righteousness, or you can choose to live within a a wicked path. In Psalm 2, we get the other major theme of the book of Psalms, and that is the theme of the Messiah. Now remember, the Psalms were written long before Jesus ever lived or was born. The Psalms were written way back in the Old Testament days, and yet one of the primary themes of the Psalms is the the one who would come. Remember, before Jesus was born, the one who would come, the Lord's anointed, God's own son, who would heal us. Now hear these words from Psalm 2. Let me read it to us. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, so much to work through in that psalm. Let me walk through some of the big stuff. Now, there is a world here, but it begins by talking about the nations. It says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Now, hear that. He's describing our literal modern day, but he's describing their day back then. He says, why do, why do nations rage against God? Why are there atheist leaders thinking that they are the leaders of their country by sheer happenstance, as if they are the ones who made themselves the leaders? Why does that happen? And and he says that they're plotting in vain against God. In reality, we can look out right now at the world and we can see countries that are, are steeped in atheistic mentality and atheistic thought, that atheism literally runs the entire governmental spectrum, and we can see them plotting against God um, and against uh, the work of the church. And Psalm 1 says, why do they do that? They're working in vain. In other words, it's not going to work. Listen to verse 4. He who sits in heaven laughs. (laughs) It's almost, it's comical. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, and he will speak to them in his wrath. Uh, it's interesting, literally, God is looking down on the nations who are trying to war against the God of the Bible, and God's like, you're not actually warring against me. So don't, don't think you're actually getting ahead. It, I am the one who writes history, I'm the one who made you leader, and I can take that away at any particular point I want. It's very important in, in verse 2, actually, I want to go back just a moment. It says this, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart. That word in your English translation for anointed is the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah. It means Savior. We talk about Jesus being the Messiah. Literally, it's saying, why why are you at war against the Lord's salvation, against his Savior who will come? And then the psalm goes on, and at the end it says, Therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and trembling, kiss the Son. You hear that? Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in your way. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You know, we don't oftentimes talk about politics, uh, and probably that's to our fault. The historic church talks about politics all the time because the historic church was rooted in the reality of Psalm 2. (laughs) And I'm going to try to do a much better job of equipping our church to handle politics. Not because I think we just need to take an unnecessary interest in politics, but because the Bible talks a lot about it. Uh, Nations and rulers are in power because God places them in power. And he takes that away as he pleases. Remember, Jesus is the king of kings, which means 
every king, every leader is ultimately in submission underneath his higher authority. And Psalm 2 says to all of those leaders and nations, kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you perish. The ultimate authority is God's. And nations are called to bow down before the holiness of God and and recognize their role to exercise justice. If we go to Romans 13 on this theme, Romans 13 is really fascinating. And Romans 13 tells the role of government and it tells the role that government should be playing in nations and authorities. And there is a good place in the Bible for good government. But literally, the governors or leaders of government in Romans 13 are called the deacons of God's justice. What does that mean? It means that God uses government to extol his wrath on evil and wrongdoing. He literally executes his justice through good government. But Romans 13 and Psalm 2 both also recognize that for that to take place in a way that God intends for it to take place, so that his wrath is not stirred up, Psalm 2, it must be done in submission to the Lord. And they must actually execute God's standard of morality, God's standard of justice. Governors and kings and presidents, they cannot make up justice as they go. Justice is what God says justice is. That's Psalm 2. And I think this is a very important conversation for us. I'm going to not maybe not go too much further than that just right now. But I want to give us some of those categories because Psalm 2 is literally the doorway to experience the Psalms. And if we're going to read through the Psalms and really be people of the Word in this season and get to know how does the Word shape us and give us a biblical worldview, that's a category we should be thinkers of. We should literally be processing What does the Lord say about government? What does the Lord say about nations? And how do I process all this stuff going on? We want to think biblically from the word of God up and have that shape our mind and most importantly, shape our hearts. In the center of this is a great hope for the Christian. The great hope for the Christian is that no matter what happens in the world, whether there's wars raging or whether there's evil lurking or whether we disagree with our politicians or agree with our politicians, you name it. God, our God, is the King of Kings. He rules, he reigns, and frankly, Psalm 2, he laughs in derision. (laughs) In Psalm 2, he laughs uh, when others hold him in derision. He's above it all, and he will orchestrate history on his terms and his ways. I hope you're encouraged by that today, Park. Uh, If I sowed seeds of confusion, I did not intend to. I wanted to get us into Psalm 2. And uh, I love talking about these things with you. I love you. I miss you. Continue to encourage one another. Continue to be people of your word, jumping into your word, knowing your word, and loving your word. And I believe God's going to do a great work in our church through all of this. Lord willing, I'll see you very soon. Bye.